Tuesday, October 18th, and it is time for your weekly regiment of nerd talk. I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And this week, you're reviewing a couple of things. I've got many reviews. Did that just turn everything off? Um, what are you trying to do? Just mute the overall sound. Alright, so we're gonna get the one second All right, screw so up sound. L2 mute. It muted everything when I did that just now. Yes. Okay. And your point is? Just checking. I don't want to cut off our listening audience. If uh, we have one of those. Yes, Echo is actually already in the chat. So, hi, chatters. Chatter right now. <laughs> I well, suppose we, I should have gotten on Facebook first. We'll do the prerequisite po- social networking thing as soon as we can. Till then, hi, Echo. Welcome to our chat. Social networking like a boss. Watch as I forget our show's URL. <laughs> if you'd like to listen to us and happen to be listening to us in the future, you can chat future. with us every... Or watching us. Someone could be watching us in the future. That's right. People are watching me. <laughs> okay, I'm creeped out. Um, so yeah, if you're listening to us or watching us at a future date, you can join us every Tuesday night at 6 p.m. Central Time. And chat with us live through our site. Just click that cool little hey click here to listen live and sign into our IRC chat. And you can be one of those people who contributes to the show. We'll even acknowledge you by name. Guess we usually do that. Right? Alright. Sending the obligatory Facebook post now-ish. Yup, yup. And we're connected to chat. Hello, Echo. Tell us if you can hear us. Echoing, if you will. Um, maybe? Possibly. It's Disgaea 4 today, at any rate. Anyway, yeah. Tonight we will be discussing Disgaea 4, the latest in releases from Nipponichi. Yup. It's a Disgaea game. Overlords, demons, the netherworld. Grinding! (laughs) Tedious, tedious grinding! Woohoo! Like, I was super bored just watching you. I don't even know. Like, Grinding like a boss. It's a special kind of gamer that gets into the Disgaea games. Uh, clearly. And by special, we mean, you know... Special. <laughs> so, we'll be talking about that. I'm going to pull the mic closer so that we're a little clearer, easier to hear. That totally rhymed. Uh- and yes, as Echo stated, there is so much sardines in this game. It is ridiculous. Ridonculous, if you will. I, I will not, actually. All kinds of crazy. Hello, Q. I, I feel like being contrary. You know, just having Q join our chat, I really feel like Nerd Talk is now properly equipped. You know, he could give us a pocket watch that detonates things. Or possibly a sports car that has its own coffee maker that happens to dispense poison. Sorry, James Bond jokes. Yeah. You haven't gotten to make any of those in a long, long time. No, because we don't review any of the Bond games, because we know what they're going to be. Wow. Hey, guys, this is like Goldeneye. No, it's not. Um, I should stop Um, reading Twitter while we're on the show, because... Yep, Q, that is in fact what we are. Welcome! We are nerds who talk about things. You're in the wrong place if you didn't want to hear that. Woo. All right, so yeah, we've got a review to do, so we should do it. We will also be discussing a movie, because I went to one of those this week at least. Somebody has to study for midterms. We're going to be talking about the 2011 re- prequel release thing of the thing. How appropriate. Right? It, it happens. The... You're, you're seriously narrating yourself Googling right now? I'm Googling like a boss. There we are. Anyway, so do you want to do the thing first then, get it out of the way, or... Nah, I really think we should do the game review first. We're going to have more to say about the game review, to be truthful. Yeah. <sighs> okay. So, get the, to talking. The <laughs> Disgaea 4. It's a thing. We played it. So, yeah. Ooh, do we have the box handy? We um, the box. It's in the drawer. You can go Aww. grab it. So, yeah. Disgaea 4 was released on 
September 6th, 2011. Wrong direct. Next one down. Uh, and the game there. version actually claims to have contained more voice acting options for the English version than the Japanese version because they uh, specifically narrated some extra lines. Yep, so there we go. There's the box. Um, available in all of fine gaming establishments, which means we pretty much couldn't find a copy of it for a couple days. Yeah. Watch as Pixie messes with the camera's resolution. Focus. It's called Focus. Technicalities. Hey, PyroSim! Yay! He's talking. Um, As nerds are wont to do. Yep. So, yeah. Disgaea 4... Basically, if you've ever heard the plot or seen a Disgaea game before... It's weird. You're going to have a lot of weirdness. Uh, As with all the Disgaea games, it takes place in the netherworld. I don't like to call things random because that word has been so tossed about but when by you like, have teenagers a... on Facebook that it doesn't mean anything. But when you have a character who's shouting about his vampiric overlord powers and then switching gears and immediately shouting the merits of sardines, random is an appropriate term. It's... It's weird. It's crazy. It's what you expect from playing a Disgaea game. It has prinnies. The corrupted souls of humans who are reincarnated as servants in the netherworld. I like inane. Pyrosim suggests inane is a good word. I suppose, like, expect random. That That's... Expect random, expect crazy. Uh, yep. And, and... Yeah, Echo brings up a good point that the characters are really 2D. They are designed to be there to specifically display one or two character traits, and that is pretty much all. Like, the, these are not what I'd describe as well-rounded characters. This is what I'd call a decent story. It, it conveys what it wants to very well, and it's humorous. By and no means is this what I'd call a great story. There's certainly enough interest there to make you go, I gotta see what they're doing next. Yeah, you can at least give it that credit, that unlike Final Fantasy XIII's characters, I want to see where these people are going. Uh, I want to know why Fenric is... Uh, so loyal to his master. I want to know why Valva Torres is as crazy as he is. I want to know why they sound so intensely homoerotic. <laughs> also a very great question. <laughs> yup. Like, so, uh, we're talking like the, the main menu screen of uh, <laughs> Super Street Fighter 4 here. This is bad. <laughs> yeah, Fenric's lines can all be taken horrifically out of context, and it is hysterical. I don't even think it's out of context! You, you think there is some definite... At face definite, value, You think there is some pretty, man love going on between those two? I, I think they would like to make out while grabbing handfuls of chest hair, yes. Well, <laughs> considering Fenric doesn't wear a shirt and is wearing, like, the lowest riding leather pants in the history of gaming, I'd say lower than monkeys, even? That, that might not be out of the question, really. Just, just saying, someone's gonna make some yaoi to this. Someone already has. Rule 34, dude. Alright, alright, you win. This is, has been out in Japan for like a year now. So, uh, I guess we'll start where we always do. Graphics! Um, yup! So, graphically, it's like any Disgaea game. It's 2D sprites on the battlefield, surrounded in 3D environments. Turn-based combat... The same old turn-based combat you're used uh, to. The character sprites have been cleaned up and actually look fantastic. This is the first Disgaea game that was actually designed for the PlayStation 3. Uh, Disgaea 3 was originally designed to be a PS2 game that they ported to the 3 when they heard it was coming out. Um, So the graphic cleanup looks incredibly nice. The animations are very fluid. Yeah. There, there is much better. Valvator is this cloak fluttering in the wind, which he now does in the like cutout version mm-hmm. when he's when they're doing scenes mm-hmm. of dialogue, and he does it on the battlefield when it's showing what the character model actually looks like too. They've they've got both versions. They look very good. Um, I like all the character designs in this. I think they're very cool. Valvatores is including um, Valvatores is a leather pants is a massive improvement over the previous game's protagonist. I, I thought Mal was just a stupid, ridiculous design that had nothing really going for it. Um, if you grab my copy of the Disgaea Three box, he's right on the cover. Or you could look up Disgaea Three Mal. 
but I thought he was just a ridiculous Can you character. Grab stuff. Provided I can find it. Here there you go. go. So yeah, there, there's the difference between the two characters. We've got the white-headed, weird school uniform plus glasses Mao, who so, I, I thought was ridiculous from day one. I mean, I will give credit. Uh, Vic uh, Mayana does a great job with Mao's voice. He's the only thing that made that game redeemable. However, Val Torres actually looks ridiculously cool. The protagonist from Disgaea 4. So, comparison shot. Yeah. He, he's actually the... Reflective. There we go. He's the first character in the series I would describe as mature. Both no. in design and in personality. Better shot of that one. Because even Adele in, the, in Disgaea guy. 2 was clearly not all there. He, he was not a mature character. I'm just going to leave these here. That's fine. This is the second time you've made me get up. Yep. Oh, I'd ask for a coffee, but I'm worried she'd hit me. <laughs> Alright, continuing. So, <laughs> graphically, um, the the battles and the cutscenes are exactly what you'd expect from a Sky game. Cutscenes are two-dimensional character cutouts that have more animation than the previous games, but don't expect, like, full animated scenes from any of them. Mm -hmm. All the dialogue is delivered with these static cardboard cutouts that have movement to some degree. Um, The in-game characters are as they would be rendered in the battlefield. They're their sprites. These are extremely high-res sprites, which is exactly what I'd appreciate from them. Um, All of the characters look fantastic. All of the, like, staple extra characters are back, so the fighters' models are the same, uh, male fighter and female fighter. The skulls and the witches are the same. Um, that said, there are some new character sprites, which I appreciate. They, they did expand on the party members what you can get and what monsters you can have in your group, and I think that's great. There are more unique uh, humanoid enemy sprites that weren't in the previous games, that I appreciate seeing, because in in the previous games, really, you could expect to see on the battlefield exactly what you could have in your party. And expanding it so that, yeah, there's a lot of NPCs now that you will not get in your group definitely adds to things. And yes, Echo, a measle, is ridiculously powerful. He's pretty much the first real boss of the game. Because I wouldn't count Axel as anything near a boss. Um... Moving on to the soundtrack, um, I, I really like this one better than Disgaea 3's. I think the soundtrack took a more serious twist, whereas the, the previous soundtrack was a lot of trumpets, uh, a lot of really almost satirical-sounding music for what it was. Disgaea 4 embraces the creepiness of the netherworld that I always felt Disgaea should, should have behind it, the just slightly off-kilter evil that, that the series really is. I mean, you're playing an, an evil overlord, but the story always has redeeming qualities for these characters, ways that they're not the villains, despite the fact that they're they're bad. They're evil. They're in the netherworld. So I, I do appreciate the tweaks to the soundtrack that that brings in. I think that's a really positive uh, change. It's a thing very few people will actually take a point to notice. But But this one actually does have a much better soundtrack. (laughs) Um, I did really like the addition of new characters' voices. Mm -hmm. Um, So when you create a character in this game now, uh, a generic party member, one of the problems with the previous games was if you had multiple versions of this same character, so say that I wanted two witches in my group, They're both going to have the exact same voice, which means I'm going to be hearing their dialogue a lot. Not so much dialogue as, like... As their battle sounds. Or... Yeah. Catchphrase. Yeah, for some reason my male warrior's obsessed with busting balls, which I thought was hysterical the first time I heard it, and now I'm like, yep, he's going to go threaten someone's junk again every time he comes out onto the field. Yep. I think Pixie heard it, like, a dozen times in just the time she watched me playing this. Um, but now, when you create one of these generic party members, you actually have the option to select from three different voices for those characters. 
which isn't. So it doesn't is just it the same line. No, or? it's all different lines. All three versions have different lines and different vocal sounds. Hmm. So I actually thought that was really awesome. It, I would like more strategy RPGs to do that. It wasn't just like we're going to modulate the voice so it sounds a little different. It's we're giving them a different voice and all new lines. Hmm. And each of the sets of lines are supposed to reflect a different personality. So for my female warrior, uh, she had the cool but cute version, the brawny lass, and the uh, nimble warrior. Which are the game's names for them? Yes. Which were the reflection of uh, the cool character, the strong-sounding character, or the smaller-sounding character. Mm-hmm. So I, I actually thought that was really neat. Which did you go with? I ended up doing the cool but cute. Could have called that. Yeah, I'm only going to have one of those characters, so I'm like, which one of these sounds the best? So I listened to their lines a couple times and decided that's the Decided one I this one won't drive me completely insane? Yes, I will not be nuts by the end of this game, having listened to that character. Now, now, we're a long way from the end of the I, game. I'm, I'm one of those Disgaea players who actually likes my created party members more than the game's special characters. I, I will generally embrace one or two of the... The special characters, the one, the story characters that the game gives you. But other than that, I will run a party entirely based around my humanoid characters that I designed. Because I, I like having that degree of control. And that's one of the things Disgaea is great for. You can customize your character however you want if you're willing to put the time in. I can give them abilities from completely different characters. I can train them up to use any weapon I possibly want. I can give them any skill I can think of as long as I'm willing to invest the time to earn the points to do it. Which is um, actually why a lot of a lot of people don't like the story characters because as Echo brought up in chat, the story characters are ridiculously overpowered. Like, they, they make combinations that normally it would take hundreds of hours to earn on some characters. Mm-hmm. Or they have unique char- abilities that it's actually impossible to earn on some characters. Every one of these story characters has, like, one unique talent that the other party members just can't have. Mm-hmm. So that that's where the comment from is that some of them seem ridiculously broken. Um, Alright, so moving on. I guess the next category we're going to go into is story. And as we've already said, it's a crazy one. So you play as Val Torres, a former vampire overlord who has sworn off drinking human blood forever. For reasons as yet uncertained. Yeah, they, they kind of keep that one in, uh, into later in the game. But it, it's a good plot point that mm-hmm. they eventually reveal. And because of this, he has lost all of his powers and has gone from being an evil overlord to being a pretty trainer. The person responsible for training the lowest social bracket of the netherworld. Also would like to point out that instead of blood, he now subsists entirely on a diet of... Sardines, which he will remind you of every chance he gets. I don't think they're that good myself, and I'm not usually a picky eater. Seriously, when the warden of the prison died, supposedly... He thought it was an honor to this guy to go leave a sardine head on the corpse. Because he thought it was a matter of respect. That's basically stray cat food! Yeah, <laughs> and, and Fenric, his servant, was like, you do realize that's an insult in most cultures. And he was like, I won't believe it! Such a noble sardine! This is an honor! That, that, that is food for stray cats. I thought it was hilarious. Wow. And, like, every... During every one of the... This this guy is kind of famous for the preview for the next episode or the next chapter of the game. Always has, like, some off-the-wall narrative from the main character as to what the next chapter is going to contain. It Mm -hmm. never is actually accurate. For some reason, Valvatoris just feels the need to end every one of these with a fact about sardines. Yeah. Have you bothered to look any of these up? No. Just don't take care. it at face value? Yep, don't care that much. And you know what? I'm going to believe him. What was the latest one? Um, that sardines actually can contain the most omega-3 of any type of fish. 
Okay then. I'll believe that. They still smell awful. <laughs> yep. So yeah, um, basically Valvatoris finds out... Maybe that's why he likes them so much, because he's dead and can't taste anything. It's possible. And so maybe because it's so pungent? I don't know, I thought vampires couldn't really eat, but whatever. I, I thought we were putting aside suspension of disbelief for the purpose of this. It is. We're talking a, about... A, a vampire training lost human souls who take the form of pe- cloth penguins. Precisely. Yep. So, um, basically Val Torres realizes that the government of the Netherworld is corrupt, which is was probably a big hint when they call it the Corruptament. That's just the name for it. And so he sets out to overthrow the current president of the Netherworld and become the new leader. Okay. So basically, it's just loaded with insanity and political satire. And I can appreciate that. There, There's all kinds of commentary on useless wars and useless spending. There's the mechanic during which you have to propose bills to the Senate. Which has been in since the original Disgaea, but now actually makes more sense as to why you're doing it. I, I just like the little embezzlement option there. <laughs> embezzlement nothing. If you they uh, turn down one of your votes, you have the option to beat them forcibly into voting yes. You basically eliminate everyone who voted no on your bill. And provided you can win the fight, which sometimes that's the hardest thing in the game. Some of those senators are ridiculously powerful. Ben, my opportunity to play that zinger is now lost. Gone. This is why you shouldn't mute that thing. It's the soundboard. Yeah, I forgot. So, um, yeah, I... I really think it's hilarious that they're they're working this kind of political satire into this game. Just a little bit deeper than the past iterations. Mm-hmm. It's a it, it, I think it makes more sense than the past games. I mean, Laharl running around and beating people up because he wanted to be the, become the evil overlord again that his father was made sense in the first game. But, like, in the second one, Adele going before the, the Demon Senate didn't make any sense. It, it never made sense why he was there. Um, in 3, they changed it so that instead of going to the Senate, you were actually going to the school board. Which was hilarious. Because it's a school for demons. It makes sense, I guess. And, I don't know, I really like the Senate system in this one. I feel it's appropriate. Mm-hmm. Uh, also back is somewhat... It's something like the classroom system from the original game where you could arrange the desks of your characters in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Um, Which, except, man, no teacher of mine would have ever allowed that. <laughs> yeah. A- except this time, you've got this world map that unlocks as you finish story levels. It's very risk. Yeah, and you can actually place evil icons on the map. There, there's bonuses for doing it. That's how you actually get better skill chains and characters to react to each other. Mm-hmm. Oh, I I really like that system. I, I think it's fun. Uh, so back on the line of story, I I've already said I like Val Torres. I think he's a great character compared to some of the previous ones. I actually like him over. It's Adele certainly now. interesting to listen to. Yeah, d- just like all the Disgaea characters, there's a level of insanity there. Val Torres at least isn't annoying like Mao was. Mao throughout the whole game was, I'm going to be the greatest demon overlord ever. I'm going to be cruel and vicious and mean. Except he never was because he was like the faux good guy. He wants to be the very best like no one ever was. Basically, that, that's what that came off as. Every other scene is, I have to be mean, evil, and twisted, and then he would go and... Really? We, we got a soundbite for that? <laughs> I've been waiting for a chance to use that. <laughs> I'm gonna hurt whoever keeps giving you zingers. So, Pyro? <laughs> yup. Yeah, like, I, I really hated the, oh, the no, contradictory nature of, of the Disgaea characters. Because they're always a, a huge contradiction as to what they are. We're demons, we're evil, we're vile, but we're good guys, really. That, that's always been so frustrating. And that's why I couldn't stand this guy at 3. <laughs> Despite the fact that Vic Mignogna is doing a great voice, he's doing an awesome job with the character, the character is so bloody annoying. 
Valva Torres isn't. He's committed to what he says. He believes in what he says to the point where at some points it even hurts him. The whole, I have to keep every promise I make thing. And admit it, sometimes it's a source of great hilarity. Him chasing down the Prinnies because he made a promise to them that he would give them a sardine when they finished their training. And he couldn't because they were stolen. So once he had them back, he was like, here's your sardine. Okay, I don't care about you now. You all can get exterminated. That was humorous. That was actually really funny. And also kind of sad, but... He ended up being the good guy in that situation. He's like, alright, fine, I guess I'll have to protect you if you're my vassals now. Admitted it was Fenric's idea, but... Fenric has all of the good ideas. Except for those pants, right? Basically, it's a challenge just to make his master do the smart thing. He has to trick him into it. Mm Mm-hmm. No, oh, I... Well... Hello he- and welcome to chat, Sona. Hello, League of Legends character. <laughs> and Echo is quoting lines from the game in chat. <laughs> I'm completely unsurprised. Yeah, they, uh... They make this big deal of introducing the new story mechanic that, hey, we ran out of pretty skin, so... Some human souls that have gone to the netherworld instead just run around as themselves, and the character Fuka was actually given a printy hat because they couldn't give her a printy skin. So that would be that character that you saw while I was playing. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think all of it's really just funny. They, they do a good job. If you can get into the random weirdness of Disgaea, the story is actually enjoyable. Mm-hmm. But you have to be in the mood for that weirdness. If you're taking this game seriously... You're all like... Uh... Yeah, you're you're gonna hate this. You're gonna be like this. This is retarded. She's this scouting. is what this is what it looks like when you hate things that you're playing, right? <laughs> I don't know. Usually, it looks like me punching my own skull. In, in the case of some of the games we've reviewed, or walls, or walls, or desks, or desks, or tables. Did we not list the things that I've punched? <laughs> Too late. So, yeah, Should have said um, that before I got started. Moving on, the gameplay, it, it what can I say? It's Disgaea. That, that's all there is to it. There, there's nothing else you can say about it. This is a Disgaea game at its heart. If you've played a Disgaea game before and didn't like it, you're not going to like this. There, there is nothing that has been new that will change your mind on that. Mm. However, if you're a big fan of Disgaea, if you like the grind, if you like the character customization, and if you like the weird story... This is really for you. Uh, the tutorial is really going to grate on a veteran player because it's the same thing over again. And they really, really pile on the tutorial. Yeah, in fact, they spread it out over multiple chapters. So it's going to. But gonna, hey, for new people, probably a good thing. For new people, it will introduce the mechanics to you and it tries to do so in a humorous way. You get commentary from the characters about how stupid this is that they already know it. Um. And you get, like, the quips back and forth between the characters. Fenric actually does comment if you win the battle without using the technique that he just taught you. So, like, decided to go through that one head first, huh? You do know that behind some doors are brick walls, right? Basically telling you if you don't learn this mechanic, you're probably going to die. No, that, that's the developers going, ah, Why? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah um, why don't you use these things that I make for you I, I mean part of the really big appeal it's all of, very Stanley parable yeah part of the huge appeal of Disgaea is that it's an endless grind if you want it to be if you want to just burn through the storyline and get to the end of the game it's about a 40 hour experience that said this game has infinite replayability that will last for as long as you want it to it's a freaking long game, is what he's saying, I think. It's an endless game. You can endless be, endlessly be reincarnating your characters back to level 1, increasing their stats so that they're even more powerful when you get them to the level that they were. I mean, the maximum level in this game is 9,999 on a character. You don't level quickly. When you start like getting into the multiple thousands range, you actually level rather slowly. You can endlessly increase the difficulty of the enemies... Uh, be leveling up items. Yeah, you can actually go into your items to level them. So even if your character is somehow done being leveled, you can then go level up their gear. 
Okay. This game can be the endless grind if that's what you want. I'm sure there are still people who throw in Disgaea 1 and still play it. Bad. I, I, I'm, I'm not so much a fan of, like, the, the tons of grinding. I haven't been since, well... Nope. Dis- we decided it was necessary in Pokemon. Disgaea probably is not your thing, then. Yeah. Just just saying. Um, they are going to be introducing the downloadable characters again. So, characters from past Disgaea's, characters even from possible future Disgaea's, will be added to the game for you to defeat and then add to your party. Hmm. Which has always been a fun feature. beating them into submission? Basically. That's, they added tons of these things to Disgaea 3, and I always thought that was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, the, the strongest secret boss in the game is uh, Printager X Gao, which basically it's a giant mecha printy, um, who is level 5,000. Yup. It's just ridiculous. Why is that a thing? Mm-hmm. No, seriously, why is level 5,000 a thing? Because, frankly, they feel that people should be able to grind like that. Um, the game's getting outstanding, or got ex- outstanding ratings from the traditional gaming sources, and, frankly, it's going to get one from me, too. Um, if you're a fan of the Disguise series, this is the best that it has to offer. What about new people? Uh, new people, if you're interested in turn-based RPGs, this is a good one. There, There's no reason that I wouldn't recommend this to someone who wants a turn-based RPG mm-hmm. and who wants the ability to grind in a game, to just overpower the crap out of it, and to just keep going until you're ready to be done. I see what you did there, Q. With, with Disgaea, you are never going to run out of content. It is an endless game that will last for as long as you want it to, which is a big compliment to give a game. Uh, If it's up your alley, if the endless grinding, if the endless character customization is what you want to do, this is a great way to do it. The story is solid, the characters are solid, the mechanics work. Um, If you don't like turn-based RPGs, if you're the kind of person who looks at that and goes, oh my god, numbers kill me. This, This is not a game for you, but not it, exactly my cup of tea. But it wasn't designed to be. Mm-hmm. This is not a game for you. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm going to recommend it to turn-based strategy fans and anyone who's who's liked a Disgaea game or liked anything else Nipponichi has put out. This is the peak of their work. Okay, then. To anyone who looks at this and is like, nope, you've had the right assumption. Nope is the right answer. <laughs> Man, I need to have a zinger for that. The epic nope. Yep. We just need Lana doing it. Yep. Sounds like a plan. Let's do it. Alright. So yeah, that's our review of Disgaea 4. Um, If you're into that kind of thing, do it. If you're not into that kind of thing and are sure you wouldn't be, don't. I'm surprised we haven't seen old. Right? We had a special announcement specifically for old. Yeah, I'm kind of shocked. Maybe he's doing something tonight. Oh well. Oh well. We've got plenty of time. I'll throw it at him when it gets here. I'm sure you will. So, yeah. um, Moving on, then, I guess. We've got more announcements regarding To Kill a DJ. Yes, the biannual uh, charity that we do to benefit Advocate Hope Children's Hospital Family Assistance Fund. Yes, I know it's a mouthful. No, they won't change it. So, yeah. um, Just a couple quick things. We'd like to thank Graham Cracker Comics for contributing a ton of stuff. Yep. Some of it, which is already listed on our site. If you go to nerdtalkshow.com slash bid for charity, or just click the little bid for charity button near the top of the page, uh, you you can um, look at all the things we have available for auction, including this fine um, wolf confrontation, and, uh, confrontation army. Which is totally pre-painted already, and actually has some really sweet models. Uh, donated to us generously by Leisure Hour Hobbies Mm -hmm. in Joliet. You can also get some of these really spiffy bead sprites made by Awesome Sauce Sprites and Luca. 
And um, there are more of those to come still, which are getting work done this week. Um, we also have finalized the Malifaux miniature auction, which we no, been we haven't about. because it's not posted. <laughs> it's not posted yet, but the actual format is finalized. So those of you interested in Malifaux. Uh, this is the Weird Miniatures game, uh, Malifaux.com, if you want to take a look at it. So, the way the auction is going to work is we're going to start it at $40. That's going to cover the cost of the models, which all this is going for charity anyway, so technically I'm donating the cost of the models. Mm-hmm. But that's going to at least cover the minimal. For $40, if you bid, the winner is going to be able to... I'll send them an email as soon as they win. They're going to be able to pick one of the starting crew boxes, any of them that are currently out, which this week also sees the release of the Molly Squid Pidge box, who is a new Resurrectionist henchman, and the Karis box, the Arcanist Winged Fire Lady. So those two boxes come out this week. Brand new. You can pick any crews that are out after the auction ends. I will order that crew... And if the auction sells for over $75, I will also order a set of Dragonforge custom bases for those characters. So they will be on nice bases if it sells for over $75. Regardless of what it sells for, I will paint that crew. I'll do a nice job on it, make sure it looks all spiffy. Build and paint. Yep, I will build them, I will pin them if required, and I will paint them. You will get a full custom job that I would put on these things as if they were my own models. I'm not going to skimp on charity here. You, you've you donated to charity. You've earned the proper treatment of these things. So whatever the crew is, I'll build it. I'll paint it. I'll base it if the thing's over $75. And I will mail them to you in your own very nice USPS flat rate box complete with all the stuff that came with it. So you'll get the original box, you'll get the cards, you'll get the models. And I'll make sure they're protected and shipped out nice. And free shipping! And yeah, I'm not going to charge you shipping, because you're already paying for the auction. So yeah, that's what you get for winning the Malifaux uh, box auction. He still needs to write that in a way that we can post it on the site, but yes, that will be a thing. Yep. So yeah, that is exactly what that's going to be, and honestly, I think you're getting a sweet deal, because unlike the original idea, which was to do a War Machine box with Malifaux, you've got your crew. Okay, you can play the game. You need your crew and a deck of cards. That's it. You don't have to buy more models if you don't want to. That's it. So So rather than selling you something that would require more work, selling you this pre-painted, you can now play the game as long as you have a deck of cards. And who doesn't have a deck of cards, really? <laughs> really, you can use just a standard bicycle deck. Uh, so I'd like to point out that all of the auction items will come with free shipping. For whoever wins them. All of them. And we've got some new stuff up. In addition to the Confrontation Army and the Bead Sprites, there's also... Um, the Conan the Barbarian t-shirts that we received. Those are all medium size. But those are ridiculously cool-looking shirts. And they are made out of a very nice fabric. Nice and thick. Yep, so that's something to look into. We also have a set of... He-Man posters. Yep. There are two. We've got two He-Man posters. One is portrait uh, orientation featuring Skeletor. The other is a landscape orientation featuring He-Man and Skeletor duking it out. And Battle Cat. Can't forget Battle Cat. And so... Those are actually pretty sweet-looking posters. We also have a custom limited edition Grey Hulk bust that was uh, donated by Graham Cracker, which is really kind of sweet. Yep, so... And you can look at pictures of all these items on the bidding page, so if you swig on over to nerdtalkshow.com slash bid for charity... Yep, those are all available. Which I will type into chat. All of those are currently available. You can just bid for them as you wish. Seriously, it's for sick children. And their families. Yes. Oh, the children. Why not, right? All right. 
So moving on, let's talk the thing for a bit. So I would also like to point out these auctions you guys have until we end our To Kill a DJ broadcast at, um, was it 6 p.m.? Mm-hmm. On um, Tuesday, November 8th. So get bidding, because I'm not going to keep doing this crap after we've had the show. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Um, the thing came out last Friday. And, uh, yep, it's a prequel to the 1982 film by John Carpenter. Uh, the, you could probably consider the main star to be Mary Elizabeth Weinstead, who most of you will remember as Ramona from Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, where she kind of plays the same character. You'll remember Ramona from Scott Pilgrim was kind of bland and just kind of yep. scenery. Yeah, that's how she is in this movie, too, except she runs and screams a little more. Just kind of stands there with this look on her face. I'm watching what's going on. Yes, that that's kind of it. I'm, I don't think this woman can act. Admitted, she's not, like, offensive. It's not that bad, but, like, she... Not terribly good, She either. doesn't do much. She's there for, like, background material. Okay, so... I'm pretty convinced that Norway is just, like, screwed as far as monsters go, because the way these guys react to the idea of being consumed by a monster, it seems like it's an everyday thing for them. Like, oh no, monster! But that none of them act like, oh my god, what is this thing? I, I, we need to run away. Everyone's like, it's a monster! Right off the bat. Probably because they've got so many trolls. Right? Like, no one acts like this is an, an out of... an unheard of occurrence. Everyone's pretty up to speed on this. I mean, maybe we're assuming that they're all high enough intelligence that, like, they're willing to believe this, but I, I don't know. Um, got no patience for sitting around! We were just waiting for that, huh? Yeah, it seemed appropriate. They're just like, nope, get to it. There's a monster. Go. Go! Kill it! Um, it's not exactly going to be full of suspense, guys. Particularly since this is a prequel, and therefore we already know how it ends. Right. Anyone who didn't know the, how this thing was going to end obviously didn't see the original. No, The it. Thing. The Thing. Um, Get the name of the movie right. So yeah, just, just a refresher for those of you who hadn't seen the movie. Um, team of scientists in, Ant- in Antarctica... They find a crashed alien ship in the ice. They take an alien that was frozen in the ice back to their camp, where they proceed to wake it up accidentally, and it proceeds to start copying people in horrific ways. So it, like, eats them, and then it makes a copy of them. Which, you know, when the copies are taunted or ready to feed again, they, like, do horrific things to the the host body in order to eat the next person. Because the thing has, like, no defined shape, so it does whatever is most convenient for consuming another person, which usually involves splitting open that body in a horrific manner. It It's just as gory as the original film, but my main problem is, like, John Carpenter's version of the thing is, like the holy grail of gore special effects. That's, like, it right there. All of this stuff was done with animatronics and puppetry and just common special effects. Makeup. makeup. That that doesn't happen once in this film. Prosthesis. All all of the special effects in this movie are done using CG. Started choking on the word prosthesis. Choking on English. That's tough. (laughs) And, like, specifically, special effects that look outdated to be polite. Like, some of these effects are just downright bad. Like, things you would expect out of, like, 1990s generic action films. Sick burn, bro. Right? Some of these are terrible. Like, uh, the, the first major... You need some ice for that burn, Carpenter? The first Feel it from over here. It's not it's not Carpenter to blame for this. Carpenter had nothing to do with this. His his version of the movie is utterly fantastic. This is directed by uh Mathis von Hedgen Jr. No, no. It's directed by a Norwegian guy. No no. 
<laughs> You're missing the point. The the idea of something being take take taking homage out of and I what's a polite way to put this that's a little more radio friendly. I'll get back to you on this. Okay. The, the the idea being that it's I, I guess the, the the idea that I'm going for is that it's an insult in that way. Yeah, I, I until actually, I come up with a better way to word that. I actually think Echoes put it perfectly here. The original movie, The Thing, was about people suspecting, "Oh no, who is this creature? Which one of us is is hiding it?" And so it's it's a lot about paranoia. It's about trying to figure out who is who. And the thing is really good at hiding in that movie. It like only but, reveals it only reveals itself when it is sure one hundred percent. I am going to consume this person, or, oh no, I'm caught and have to defend myself. Those are the only two, to- two times that the thing is revealed. Again, I'd like to draw back to this, this. This problem seems to revolve entirely around the fact that it's a prequel and we know how this ends. But with this camp, we really don't. Because even here, they threw us some shockers as to... Who got away? How did these people get infected? What was going on? We didn't know if someone had escaped the Norwegian camp. We knew that everyone who was actively there died. Mm. But there could have been people who got away. Specifically, there's a nice reveal in that. We don't know, uh, did any parts of the thing get away? Because we know, obviously, one piece did. The dog. The dog that started the original movie got away. We knew that. But there could have been other pieces. There was this really big threat early on in the movie that, oh no, this dude who was potentially infected and sick before they realized what was going on was about to be airlifted to the coast. I was expecting him to to actually leave and the director to expect us to forget that he left until the end of the movie. Because at that point it hadn't been revealed that, oh no, this thing getting fluid on you could infect you. But um, but yeah. Um, as I, I, as Echo I, I puts it, I think that tends to. I think that 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 probably, like I said, it certainly didn't help. Um, but kind of kills your little um word I'm looking for. Sense of suspense. You're not exactly on edge here. Mm-hmm. Well, the director really screwed up with that because the thing gets like center focus on the camera so many times. And, like, in the original, you got brief glimpses of it from time to time, but it was rarely ever the center focus of the camera. Now you've got the thing, like, actively roaming the halls in, like, its morphed, mutated form. Mm-hmm. Just hunting people. That That's not the point of it! Slasher film! The point is not it is a stop, creepy stop, stop. alien slasher film. It's, oh no, it's revealed itself because it was cornered. It's probably going to try to hurt people and then get away so that it can take a new shape. Mm -hmm. So that it can hide again until it's convenient. It wouldn't run around chasing people. (laughs) Unless those people are alone and they're sure that it's going to take them. Mm. Oh, well. Like, the movie also skips, like, important characters dying. Really important characters. Like, Spoilers. The secondary male character, it never acknowledges at all what happened to him. It just forgets about it. It, it goes, oh yeah, that's a thing copy of him. We, we didn't see anything about him getting taken or whatever. In fact, when his character died, we, we weren't even sure if like, his earring just somehow accidentally fell out. Because he doesn't do the, like, thing twitching when he gets flamethrower. Usually the thing, like, screams in an inhuman way and, and grows tentacles or something. I was gonna say, I-, I wouldn't be surprised by, you know, normal people twitching under flamethrowers. Yeah, but they don't tend to sprout tentacles. You don't? Not when I'm hit with a flamethrower. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, yeah, there's actually very little focus on who these characters are and what it 
what any of them matter. Because literally at the beginning of the movie, you have a room where they're partying, and it's like, yep, here's 12 Norwegian guys and the three Ameri- or four American characters, and that's all we know about them. That's it. There, there's no greater plot for any of these people. They are literally just standby cardboard cutouts to be murdered one by one. Man, now we need to have a cardboard cutout. Because we've been mentioning them a lot. Yeah, that... We need to just have a visual cardboard cutout aid that we can just you, sit you here don't actually, and have look creepy. You don't actually care about any of these people at all when they die because they are just a name and, a, and one or two personality traits that they demonstrated. Come on, guys. Even The Sims does, like, four or five. Yeah. <laughs> wow. The Sims characters are more developed than these. Well. Basically, yeah. Th- that was the point I was getting at. Way to explain the joke. So, I mean... Is it a terrible movie? Honestly, as far as horror remakes go, I'd put it above the recent ones. Like, this is no means as bad as, a. Uh, as bad as, like, the Nightmare on Elm Street remake. But, like, as, as Echo... Oh, don't even get us started on that. As Echo brings up in chat, there was more character development in the original thing, in the one scene where Kurt Russell's character was playing uh, chess with the computer and got ticked off at losing and poured his drink into the computer's uh, workings. There was more development in that one scene than... Um, then Wine said gets the entire I can movie. see you doing that. Right? Like, And then whining later that the computer doesn't work. Yeah, he never mentions it again because he never goes back up to his shack, really. But I'm sure later that winter he would have been like, I wish I could play chess. Like, the character Kate Lloyd, the only scene that I would consider character development for her is the her opening scene where she's actually doing paleontology work. That's it. That's all you get for her. That's all you get for anyone, really. I feel feel like storytelling has failed in a big way when it's just, this happened, then this, then this, then this. Yeah, there's no real twists in this movie. It's exactly what you expect. Like, the closest thing to a twist is when Hans shows Kate, hey, I've got these grenades. That's the closest thing you get to a twist the entire movie. Hans being like, check out these grenades. But, I will say, riffing this movie, which we did because we were bored, is spectacular. (laughs) So my advice, don't go see The Thing in theaters. Instead, get all your really funny friends together when it comes out on DVD and have a screening party. Because you will have a great time, especially if you guys have seen the movie Splice. Because it, Ah! it tints the commentary in so many great ways. That was hysterical. I, I I don't think I can forgive you for making that joke now. No, that totally came up in the movie. It was like, wait a minute, they just drilled a hole in that block of ice. That dude's sneaking into that room. I think he's going to do it. <laughs> I think we're going to have a splice moment. It's terrible. It's not as funny as watching Predators with Adrian Brody. Which is the funniest movie ever if you've seen Splice. I'm sorry, Predators was a great movie. It was so much better than Predator 2 because you really couldn't be worse. But, that said, watching Predators after having watched Splice is the best time you can have watching a movie. Um, I, I have nothing I can say to that. I really don't. And in that, we're going to end for tonight. I hate you. Ending on a high note, guys. <laughs> so this has been Nerd Talk for Tuesday, October 18th. I'm gonna go play Batman. <laughs> I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And you've been listening to Nerd Talk. We'll Bye. catch you next week.